Hello everyone and welcome to the WRA interview. My name is Sarah Casey and I'm a project director for the World Refining Association. For those of you who are not familiar with our work, the WRA specialises in bringing the refining community together through a series of conferences, board meetings and more recently virtual conversations. We are active in Latin America, the Middle East, Asia and Europe. Today I have with me John Google, CEO of Honeywell UOP. Honeywell UOP is a leading supplier of process technology, and systems, and technical and engineering services for global petroleum, refining, petrochemical, chemical, and gas processing industries. John joined the company in 1992 and has held various positions throughout his time there, including Vice President and General Manager Process Technology, and Equipment and Vice President and General Manager for Gas Processing and Hydrogen. He is an established leader in the oil and gas processing industry. So we're very excited to have him here with us today to talk about some of the key topics the downstream industry is facing. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi John, how are you today? And can you tell us a little bit about how you've been faring over lockdown? Yes, good morning, Sarah. Clearly uh, for us, like uh, all of our colleagues in the industry around the world, uh, the lockdown has been a challenge for everybody, for ourselves and our headquarters here just outside of Chicago, Illinois, and the U.S. We went into lockdown in uh, the middle of March, actually went home on St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th and remain actually in a remote work uh, status to this day for our office-based workers. We do want to give a uh, hearty thanks to all of our essential workers who operate our catalyst manufacturing plants and R&D centers every day throughout this pandemic. And we would like to acknowledge the courageous efforts of all of our colleagues in the refining industry throughout the world who also hold essential roles and have kept the industry moving forward and kept society fueled through this challenging time. But we're humans and we all adapt. And here we are adapting to this interview. Someday maybe I can sit across the table from you and have an interview like this. But uh, today we're on a podcast and virtual and uh, we're all making do and we're keeping the industry moving forward. We're proud of the efforts of everybody working together to get that done. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see how much people have managed to adapt themselves and adapt the way they work. And it's really great that we can see many industries continuing to work and adapt. And then kind of related to that, how do you think then COVID-19 has affected the wider downstream industry, including refineries, both in the short term and medium term as well? Obviously, it's just a bit more than COVID alone. It's really the combination of the oil price war that immediately preceded the sudden demand destruction from COVID-19. That is dealt, we view, a significant short and medium term blow to the refining industry, prompting, I think, all of us to focus on our strategies and our priorities at this time. And do you think when we're thinking about, you know, refiners and downstream moving forward, do you think it's been a challenge to focus on the long term when survivability has been the central issue currently, given the crisis and the oil price crash that you mentioned? I think uh, for most refiners, the issue today isn't really survival. But I believe that many are taking this time to carefully review long term mission structure, and profitability. You know, we appear to be in a, in a unique situation where the time between recovery and the generally accepted timing for peak fuels demand is on the order of a natural investment cycle. And as such, refiners in developed regions may be faced with the decision to actually make big bets before the COVID impacts are actually fully resolved. In uncertain times like these, investments in questionable assets are far less likely to be made, ultimately leading to some asset shutdowns. We've already seen this in some of these areas, and I believe we will see more portfolio rationalization with big bets being made on strong assets and closure or shutdown on others. I also believe that we're going to continue to see a strategic shift towards renewables with some of the difficult to upgrade assets being converted to renewable refineries. And we're also seeing this happen in a number of regions already around the world. In my the impact of COVID-19 on the refining industry is that it's accelerated what was already a looming situation on the horizon. You know, first, in the long term, we we'll see the more modern and complex refineries that are operating at world scale with integrated refining and petrochemicals production faring the best. And second, the industry is going to take this time to accelerate its pivot to sustainability. Thank you. And in terms of behavioral habits, then, you know, you've spoken about the different types of refiners that, you know, may survive and thinking about that in the future. But you think to what extent would you say existing behavioral habits will change after the pandemic or in the, in, you know, in the coming years? 
I expect that most companies are sharpening and narrowing their strategic focus. And I expect that refiners will exercise a much higher level of analysis and care in making their future investment decisions. Furthermore, I would expect that the business models will continue to evolve from independently managed assets toward the integration of refining and production of downstream products under a single umbrella in a pivot towards greater efficiency. Thank you. And looking at the current climate, thinking about, you've just mentioned there about the energy transition and how it might have been accelerated, thinking about how refiners will be in the future. I think then that it's true that refineries will look at the energy transition at a deeper level now, or in fact, will it be kind of something that society is looking at, but refiners might take a bit of time to pass up on, you know, given that they're dealing with a variety of different issues right now. Yeah, I believe that the current climate is likely to accelerate the treatment of uh, CO2 as a true economic cost. I believe that we're already starting to see this now. We expect that the industry will transition to a regime where CO2 reduction is pursued primarily due to its economic impact. And we're already seeing this happen on renewables projects. And firms like Shell and Repsol and BP, they've come up with these targets uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050 and changing the way their business operates. What do you think about those targets? Do you think that they're realistic? Well, I'm really not in a position to comment on other companies' specific targets, but in general, I believe that CO2 reduction projects are likely to proceed more quickly when carbon has a cost, and that can come through either regulation or taxation. Interesting, yeah. And in terms of Honeywell UOP then bringing it back to your company, what you know, have you learned any lessons in terms of energy efficiency or in terms of how you may operate in the future um, over this period that you think will you continue to put into practice when things return a little bit more to normality, whatever that may be? That's a good question. I believe that the potential lesson that we're seeing is really that energy efficiency will be a larger economic issue in the future and that producers need to think about a world where many lower tier assets become idle and the remaining players are far stronger, thereby making a wait and see approach much more risky. We already see refiners in China taking this opportunity to press forward. They've dramatically increased their capacity using the latest technologies, which afford them much higher margins while meeting the strictest environmental standards. And they're doing this all at world scale. Simply put, they're deploying their capital more efficiently. Others in the industry are closely watching and stepping up their game because they don't want to lose the benefit of time from a competitive standpoint. But certainly we believe that the uh, current environment is putting and will put a forever greater focus on energy efficiency. Thank you for that. I think it's really interesting. You know, a lot of our listeners want to hear about how different people within the industry are facing COVID-19 and facing the challenges that came out of that, including oil price crash. And it's interesting in downstream because that then obviously mixed with looking at how refiners will be part of the future energy mix. So really interesting to hear your thoughts on that. In terms of moving on to kind of a different topic now, but looking at different technologies, which areas are you most focusing on and what technology do you think will provide the biggest ROI and will be the most focused on for refiners? In the well, from our perspective, there will always be a demand for more efficient conversion technologies and process intensification. Digitization is also going to bring many new efficiencies and improve reliability. But in our core refining and petrochemical space, we believe that the pivot from traditional fuels to petrochemicals will provide the biggest ROI. Therefore, one key area of focus for us is on technologies that ease or enable the shift from fuels to petrochemicals through low-cost routes to molecular management. This will most likely take the form of new separation and selective conversion technologies. In terms of sustainability, Renewable fuels remain an area of important focus for us. In fact, this is one of the few areas in the downstream that has continued to grow and thrive throughout this downturn. We're also focused on commercializing technology solutions that close the loop on plastic waste by developing technologies that chemically convert waste plastics into profitable and advantaged feedstocks. And finally, we're investing in new technologies to efficiently manage the storage and distribution of energy from renewable sources. Thank you, John. And and you mentioned quite a few times already this keyword efficiency, which is something that you're more and more spoken about. And with efficiency now seemingly key, do you think that this will be a marker for increased digitalization? You've also mentioned, you know, digitalization is something key for the future. Do you think that that will be a marker for increased digitalization then? Yeah, I believe a combination of things that we're going through right now are going to stimulate or accelerate the shift to digitization. 
One, we've all learned that sometimes we may not be able to get to the plant or to our office to keep the place running. So certainly the connected plant idea, the connected worker idea is front of mind of all of us in the industry. Furthermore, the uh, advanced technologies and AI capabilities coupled with our ability to connect these plants allow us to proactively service our customers' assets and help them optimize the performance of their plants. So all in all, on balance, I really do believe that the current situation will have only an accelerating effect on the rate of digitization throughout the entire oil and gas industry and refining included. And then thinking about as well different technologies that may be very pertinent for the future of downstream. One thing, a few technologies that seem to be the most spoken about within our community and across our network is hydrogen, chemical recycling and CCUF. They keep coming up in conversations and I think that a lot of refiners are are looking at this group of technologies and thinking about which one will be most important for them in the future. So thinking about hydrogen, chemical recycling and CCUF, do you see any of those as having potential to really significantly affect the future of the downstream industry? And if so, which one would you kind of bet would have the most significant effect or do you see as having the ability to have that significant effect in downstream? Well, instead of picking a winner, I think I'll share with you the view that uh, we believe that the downstream industry will need solutions for hydrogen, chemical recycling, and carbon capture. And that's why we're actually working on all three of those areas. In terms of hydrogen, you know, some refiners see themselves as oil processors while others identify themselves as energy providers. Those that can pivot their self-image towards being an energy provider are more likely to see hydrogen as merely an alternative fuel, even if that hydrogen is produced by solar and or wind energy. In terms of carbon capture, it certainly has a role to play in the transition to hydrogen economy, but its success will ultimately depend on the ability to go beyond sequestration and will be enabled by technologies that can convert it economically for other uses but it's a bit too early to discuss those technologies in detail right now. And finally, you mentioned chemical recycling. and I mentioned it a little bit earlier in the interview. Chemical recycling solves a fundamental societal problem with plastic waste. It enables us to close that plastics supply chain as it literally involves converting waste plastics back into an oil feedstock from which you know, we can make new plastics. The challenge here is really integrating and scaling up that technology through an economically feasible petrochemical process and supply chain. Yeah, I think chemical recycling is especially interesting, you know, given how much of a big topic plastic is and plastic waste. So that's one that we find is quite interesting and a lot of people want to hear from. But, you know, I like that you didn't pick a winner there and you put your money on all the horses in the race. So it's a good answer there, John. In Europe, the European Commission, they centred their hydrogen, their strategy around hydrogen, looking at the importance of hydrogen in their 2050 carbon neutral vision. Um, I know you've spoken a little bit about hydrogen there, but I just wanted to ask you, how do you view hydrogen as a growth market for refiners, both in the US and around the world? Do you think that it's a strong growth market? Not that you need to pick a winner on this one, but just kind of getting more of your thoughts on hydrogen as a strong growth market for refiners or not. We do view hydrogen as a strong growth market. It's going to take time. It will not happen overnight. But hydrogen has always been critical to refiners. All the refiners on the phone understand that hydrogen in many ways is the lifeblood of the refinery circulating its way through the process plants in and out. And hydrogen will play a key enabling role on the pathway to a carbon capture solutions and, and other solutions. So yeah, we were quite positive on the prospects for hydrogen as a growth growth vector. And we believe that refiners should be paying attention to this and thinking about their hydrogen production strategies along the way. And then moving on to another topic, um, a little bit less related to technology. Um, IMO is something that, you know, was the talk of the town, I suppose, this time last year before coronavirus was all on our news and on our lives. So it could be fair to say that IMO 2020 has been overshadowed by both coronavirus outbreak, but also, you know, the oil price crash that we've spoken about. But can you tell us if, you know, any steps that your clients have taken to adapt the IMO 2020 regulations and anything Honeywell Europe have done to kind of assist them with that or kind of approach the change as a result of IMO 2020? You're right. It certainly was a front and center topic in the industry for quite some years previously. And I'm not so sure that had the coronavirus not come around, that IMO still would have been overshadowed by something else. Because quite frankly, IMO and the 
the regulations it imposed for the most part in a relative sense to other fuels regulations that we've seen throughout the world and other regions was easily absorbed by the market because there was plenty of access to surplus diesel at the time and already sufficient bottoms conversion capacity in place in uh, the regions around the world. Now, surprisingly, many of those investments in hydro processing and heavy upgrading technologies were actually made decades ago as a hedge really against falling gasoline demand growth and a threat that lighter, sweeter crudes would become much more expensive. So we sit back and we look at it and we realize there was some investment made in pockets around the world, but it wasn't as, let's say, transformational event as low sulfur gasoline or low sulfur diesel. In many respects, the industry could see IMO coming from a long distance off. And while they were making their investments for clean transportation fuels, call it road transportation fuels, they were also making key decisions that helped enable them adapt you know, through a relatively a low capital investment strategy to meeting the demands of IMO. You know, I mean, to build on that, you look at which technologies we think are the most attractive for adapting to the IMO regulations. You know, from our perspective, when our customers are looking at investment in new assets, we believe that bottoms operating solutions involving hydrogen addition are the most attractive because they provide the highest yields of fuels and petrochemicals in the end. And that's where we're concentrating development in our core technologies. Thank you. And looking at what happened over the last year then, were you surprised by the greater appetite for very low sulfur fuel oil over marine gas oil in the market? Or was that something that you kind of foresaw or didn't think is too much of a surprise? It really didn't come as too much of a surprise for us. We saw some of these substitution ideas and blending uh, alternatives as being some of the solutions that the industry would turn to first. And there appeared to be adequate supplies to allow people to work around the regulations while fully combining, of course. And you explained there when we, when we talked about, you know, IMO potentially being overshadowed by coronavirus, although it may have been overshadowed anyway, as you mentioned. And you did talk a little bit about the technology you view to be most important in helping people with that. Um, is there any other trends that you think will come out of this from IMO 2020, whether that be other particularly attractive technologies or a change in maybe the uptake of bottom of the barrel and residue upgrading technologies? I think there's, you know, any other kind of detail on trends or views that you want to give on that? I would have to say that I can't point to the current environment changing the trajectory or the rate of interest. The interest in these technologies for these solutions has been pretty consistent over a pretty long period of time because we've had a pretty clear view of the macro trends that are driving these changes for a long time. If I comment just a little bit on the bottom of the barrel, I, I would say that coking technology right now is facing some headwinds stemming from restrictions on coke and coke production and disposal, as well as water consumption requirements for that technology. So we do see slurry hydrocracking technologies like our Uniflex MC process gaining more interest. And again, as I said before, because these technologies work on the concept of hydrogen addition rather than carbon rejection, and we're able to achieve greater yields of fuels and petrochemicals through this technology pathway. Thank you, John. And then in terms of the next five years for downstream, um, with everything changing so quickly, I know you don't have a crystal ball there and you can't say exactly how things will see, but are there any other particular you know, trends or technologies or ways, or I guess, of existing or surviving that you will see as the key to the future of downstream, you know, whether that be for refiners or, or for your Honeywell UOP as well? I think in the next five years, Sarah, refiner strategies are going to evolve here. Those who have fairly modern assets, integrated assets, will likely be well positioned to stay the course and drive for, they have competitive advantage in terms of scale, in terms of cash cost of production, uh, energy efficiency. And for those who are fortunate enough or had the foresight to invest in integrated petrochemicals production, they also have differential margins working on their side. For the smaller, let's say less complex facilities, I think they are gonna be quickly evaluating their future. And what we are seeing some are going to run the assets as long as they can. And others, though, are really, really taking a hard look at that pivot to sustainability. And I think the next five years are going to be marked with a step change in uh, refiners' interests 
particularly when you're looking at, let's say, older assets, less complex assets, putting them to work in the renewable space as a, let's say, stepping stone transition to a much more sustainable fuels industry. And I think we're going to see that transition accelerate significantly over these next five years. Yeah, I think the next five years, we have this interview again in one year, we'll have so much more to say. And if we have it again in six or seven, I think you said the acceleration and change and you know how refiners will change and adapt is going to be very interesting to see. So maybe we'll touch base then and we can talk more about what we've seen and what we expect to see. Well, we certainly hope so, Sarah, because as a technology company, nothing's better than, to us than change and meeting new challenges. That's really what our mission is for the past 106 years. We've been serving the industry by bringing forth the technologies enabled every different element of the energy industry revolutions as they've evolved over time. And we're excited to be in a position to be able to contribute through our research and development capabilities to uh, helping shape the world's transition to a much more sustainable environment uh, and uh, fuels uh, structure. It's certainly an exciting time for the energy industry more widely and, and downstream as part of that. So thank you so much for your time today, John. And um, if there's anything else you wanted to add for our audience to hear, please feel free. I would just take this time to, again, thank and congratulate all of our colleagues throughout the global refining industry for their courage and perseverance through these challenging times. And I want to thank you for inviting us to share some of our perspectives today with this esteemed group. And, you know, I wish everybody a, a very sad, safe and happy fall refining season. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time, John, and we'll speak to you soon.